Welcome, Ambassador Robinson. Good morning, everyone. And thank you all for being here today and for inviting me to join you. And Melanie, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. It's clear from my resume that I'm not allowed anywhere near Western Europe or places where you can get a good cup of coffee. As, uh, as Melanie noted, I am the newly minted Assistant Secretary uh, in the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. And I think that's a particularly good fit for me. As she mentioned in, the, in the, um, my resume, I spent most of my 30 plus years in the Foreign Service uh, in complex and difficult places. And that experience has given me a particular perspective uh, on the kind of work you do the kind of work that I hope we do together on, on peace building. And I'd like to take a, a few moments this morning to share some thoughts with you. It's important to take a clear look at that term, peace building, because it means what it says. It means that peace is not really a noun. It's not a thing or a state of being. I think it's better understood as a verb. It's something that we do. It's action that we take and it can never be passive or static. And you all understand that, of course, that's why you're part of this alliance. At the same time, I also think it's important to understand, in fact, to insist that peace is never seen as the exception, and that peace building is never seen as simply the counterpoint to conflict. Peace and the work that builds peace, those are the norms. Wars and conflict are the exception. Now I know that seems counterintuitive when you consider for how long we have been fighting in Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq and in other places, but I think we have to insist on that anyway. We have to insist that peace building is the work that should be occupying the bulk of our time and attention, even when experience tells us it's hard to make that happen. And I say this for two reasons. First, accepting that conflict is the norm, the natural state of things, and let's face it, we've had conflict since Cain killed Abel, that distracts our attention. It draws our efforts to doing conflict better, to being better at war than we are at peace. It invites us to spend more time and more money on the machinery of violence than on the tools of building a just and lasting peace. Just look at our budgets. The second reason I think it's important we understand that peace is the norm is because I am in the business of conflict prevention. The bureau I lead at state aims to give diplomats the analysis, the plans, and the programs to take steps to prevent conflict, and especially conflict's most pernicious forms, mass atrocity against civilians and violent extremism, before they gain traction. Our job is to make diplomacy more effective as it confronts the drivers and conditions that otherwise may lead to atrocity and extremism. And that's a heavy lift. It's tough because in the first place, the very concept of prevention is a hard sell. Doctors don't get as rich doing wellness checkups as they do doing open heart surgery. That pays a lot better than diet and exercise plans. Similarly, diplomats often earn their reputations by how well they respond to crises. We all work to prevent conflict. Yes, that's true. It's what every ambassador and country team tries to do every day. But as you all know, it's difficult to claim you prevented something from happening that never happened in the first place. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. How do you know? Well, the answer is you don't know. So evidence matters. That uncertainty, though, does not diminish the task. If anything, it makes our work, helping diplomats understand the dynamics of conflict, more urgent, simply because it so often is overlooked in the rush to respond, rather than to develop the foresight to prevent. Here's what frequently happens here in Washington when a conflict erupts or is about to erupt. Senior people from around the interagency gather around a large table 
and they receive a quick briefing, usually by either the military or the intelligence community. And then, as that information sinks in, they look at each other. And then finally, someone, maybe the most senior person at the table, asks the fatal question. And it's the question that is as likely to derail a constructive response as it is to launch one. It's a question that is likely to prevent us from finding a response that will help us prevent conflict in the future. And here's the question they ask. They ask, so, what do we do about this? That is precisely the wrong question to ask at precisely the wrong time. It's the wrong question because the minute the interagency community asks, what can we do about this, they stop looking at the problem. The problem is still ill understood, but they're no longer looking at the problem because now they're looking at themselves. They're looking at their budgets, their personnel, their logistics, their capacity to do something. The problem is still sitting there on the table, still misunderstood perhaps, or not fully understood, and now everybody around the table is busy trying to squeeze that problem into their pre-existing frameworks, trying to figure out how to make it work with programs they already have on tap. I can well remember not long ago when poverty reduction, education, democracy building programs all get rebranded as countering violent extremism when in fact they may have precious little to do with violent extremism. So CSO's job is to address that problem. Our job is to analyze the conflict itself without regard to any of the other filters, governance, human rights, other existing programs to help our diplomats accurately visualize the challenge they face before asking what they can do about it. In CSO, we call this maps and gaps. We analyze the data, we visualize the data, then we layer on the assets we or other partners may be able to use to address the problem, and we look for the gaps and mobilize the resources to fill those gaps. Our goal, of course, is not to find the silver bullet, there is no such thing. Our goal is to help decision makers ask better questions that may lead them to better responses. And the better we do that work, and the more we learn from it, the earlier we can position ourselves to prevent the problem in the first place. The good news is we are making progress. Uh, to those of us committed to peace building and reducing conflict around the world, violent extremism is a great challenge. Countering violent extreme, extremism is, I think, perhaps the greatest challenge that my bureau faces and perhaps some of you face. From ISIL to Boko Haram to Al-Shabaab, these organizations are the antithesis of you, of this alliance. Where you seek to address root causes of violence and foster reconciliation, they seek to inflame grievances, to encourage violence and make reconciliation impossible. Where you seek understanding, respect, and tolerance, they seek lethal exclusion. This is, in fact, about right versus wrong. This is a conflict that has a right side and has a wrong side. Decapitating innocent people is wrong. Immolating people, drowning people to make a point is wrong. Enslaving people is wrong, and we will continue to use hard power to address that. We must. But we also know that this is not a war that can be won with bullets and by hard power alone. This is a war that will be won, a peace that will be restored by organizations like you and many others working at the local community level around the world. Together, we will learn how to prevent the appeal of violent extremist organizations from attracting its disciples. We will learn how to recognize and build community resilience against the push and pull of extremism. We're committed to that outcome, and we're committed to creating more initiatives and more programs to produce that outcome. The State Department and USAID have developed and will release tomorrow a joint strategy to counter violent extremism by focusing on prevention. And it's a strategy that will rely heavily on analysis and partnerships on understanding and cooperation rather than on unilateral action. And that's important because while none of us has the silver bullet, 
we all have our assumptions and our conventional wisdom, which often enough at the end of the day doesn't seem to be that wise. You remember the experts saying that extremism is a result of poverty or lack of education. Well, our analysis now shows us that terrorists are no more likely to be poor or unemployed or come from poorer countries than people who reject extremism. In fact, survey data suggests that people who are extremely poor are less likely to support violent extremism than those who are not as poor. Similarly, deep religious devotion, far from being a risk factor for extremism, actually indicates a lesser likelihood of joining an extremist group. And getting tough on law and order, when getting tough means state-sponsored violence, actually increases the likelihood of extremist organizations gaining traction rather than reduces it. Now, none of those findings were self-evident a short time ago. We need to keep building on them, all of us together, and understanding how they apply to specific communities. And so toward that end, on the margins of last year's United Nations General Assembly, we launched the Resolve Network, the Researching Solutions to Violent Extremism, funded by CSO and based at the United States Institute for Peace. Resolve promotes opportunities for researchers, practitioners, and policymakers to come together locally and internationally to build effective and sustainable responses to the drivers of violent extremism. It promotes the kinds of partnerships that make us wiser together than any of us is alone. Now, I am sure there are some people, maybe here, who will argue that countering violent extremism has little to do with peace building. I think those two things are linked. As I alluded a moment ago, countering violent extremism is not just about the battlefield, nor is it about divining an individual's motivation for joining a group like ISIL. It's about what goes on in communities, in classrooms, in houses of worship, on sports teams, and in family gatherings. All of those are the building blocks for peace and they should be the roadblocks to violent extremism. Scientists recently found evidence, some of you may have seen this, of the oldest known mass atrocity, the murder of 10,000 men, women, and children who were systematically killed and then buried in a common grave 10,000 years ago. It's tempting to say that violence on that scale uh, is simply part of our DNA. But our job is to point to atrocities extremism, violence against innocent men, women, and children as aberrations, as toxic aberrations, and to reject them and to prevent them from happening. That's what normal is, and that's not Pollyannish idealism. It's a commitment, and I hope it's one we all share. Thank you. But thank you so much, Mr. Ambassador, and I think the message that war is not normal, that peace is the norm, is something we have to drive home every day in all of our work, especially in this political climate. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Bridget Moix to give responses from a local peace-building perspective to Ambassador Robinson. Uh, Bridget has worked for 20 years on international peace-building and U.S. foreign policy issues. From 2013 to 2015, Bridget served as an Atrocity Prevention Fellow with USAID's Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. She spent nine years lobbying on U.S. foreign policy and peace issues with the Friends Committee on National Legislation and directed the Casa de los Amigos in Mexico City, a Quaker Center for Peace, Hospitality, and International Understanding from 2006 to 2008. She worked in Cape Town, South Africa with the Quaker Peace Center during her graduate studies internship and is now pursuing her PhD with George Mason University. And she's also the US representative for Peace Direct, which is based in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Bridget. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. 
Um, I was given uh, five minutes and the role of commentator, which is really nice because I can be short and sweet, um, and uh, comment a little bit on uh, what the ambassador said. But I wanted to start by, in addition to thanking AFP and everyone here, just acknowledge um, the people in the room who have come from uh, countries of conflict. I know a number of people are here, some of our partners and others, and um, the work of prevention and the work that we're all here for um, depends on, on your leadership, and so thank you for coming here to be with us. I was um, very flattered to get the invitation to play this role, and I thought, well, I wonder why me? And then I thought, well, it could be that I've just been around for so long um, in Washington in these circles, um, actually before CSO was even formed, uh, was working to lobby for budget and resources and capacities within the U.S. government uh, to focus on prevention. So I can't tell you what, uh, how encouraging it is to hear a high-level State Department official stand here and give a speech about the commitment and work of prevention being central to the U.S. government's foreign policy. So thank you. Um, I want to acknowledge the long arc of progress uh, and, and how encouraging that, ver that is. At the same time, I think we don't want to rest on our laurels, and I think the challenges that we're facing in the world, um, some of which you laid out, really call us to think creatively and, and move not only towards prevention but towards a more local approach to addressing conflict. It is 15 years after 9-11, and unfortunately, as a mother of two young boys, five and eight, um, war has become the norm uh, for our country and our foreign policy, and that is, is deeply disturbing. So I really appreciate the call to remembering that peace building needs to be the norm, and we need to make it that way. Uh, we do face also the reality that the ways we've been addressing problems, such as extremist forms of political violence, atrocities, um, and other challenges, whether it's the refugee crisis or climate, um, continue to be from this country's government through a militarized lens first. Um, unfortunately, the good work of CSO and other parts of the U.S. government dedicated to peace building and prevention remains a tiny part of the U.S. government's role in the world um, and a tiny part of the budgets, as was also pointed out. So we as a community, I think, need to think also about how we, how we challenge that imbalance and help shift it. I want to just pose a few queries um, to uh, David and to all of us and maybe help stimulate dialogue that way. Um, the first query relates to the issue of countering violent extremism. And I think increasingly data and research by CSO, by many of you, is showing that the roots of the problem um, lie not in individuals' um, motivations or their minds necessarily, but in conditions and um, situations uh, within a society that plant the seeds um, where extremist ideologies can grow. And so while we know, for instance, that good governance, uh, democratic processes are central to helping counter the influence of extremist groups, we also know that things like the budget for democracy and governance in the U.S. government have been cut dramatically, um, similar with peacebuilding budgets and prevention budgets. So a first query is how do we align and how is CSO in your work, how are you helping to align the policies of the U.S. government um, with the, the facts and figures, the data, the information that's coming at us um, so that we can better address the problems we face. A second query uh, goes to the question of reflection. As peace builders, I think uh, reflective practice is something we're always trying to live and demonstrate. And I would uh, say that the U.S. government, um, while often trying to do that in many ways, uh, it's very hard. I've seen from the inside, it's very hard to have that kind of reflection and learning uh, that the ambassador mentioned. The new uh, um, executive order on atrocities prevention, the upcoming CVE strategy you mentioned, are extremely welcome steps, I think, for this community. I want to pose a question I posed to Assistant Secretary Sarah Sewell when the atrocity prevention executive order was released, which is, will that policy and that strategy 
also reflect upon the U.S. government's own policies. I've always wanted to see an audit done across all of U.S. foreign policy and how things like the arms trade or even our trade policies um, may or may not be contributing to uh, dynamics of conflict around the world. And so how do we get that type of reflection into, um, into our own policies and practices? And it's a genuine, sincere question and that I hope we can work together on. The third uh, query I would pose goes back to um, the work of Peace Direct and our commitment to supporting local actors and what I increasingly hear as a commitment among this community as well as the development and humanitarian community as well as within the CSO Bureau and other parts of the U.S. government to really supporting locally driven solutions to complex conflicts around the world. And I think that just as I would say 20 years ago, we were beginning to push that prevention boulder up the hill and we have really largely won the argument, if not won the budget and practices yet, we've won the argument in the sense that we recognize the importance of shifting to prevention. Similarly, I think we're now at a point where we need to really start shifting towards fundamental change to support locally led peace building, local solutions um, to problems which often begin local and then be grow into global problems. So one question um, also for CSO and for all of us is how do we better improve our approaches and our practices so that we're supporting those local peace building heroes around the world and accompanying them and letting them design and lead the change in their societies. Uh, I just want to close maybe um, a few comments to say that I think um, hearing the words I'm in the business of conflict prevention uh, very much warmed my heart and I hope we can all uh, get behind that in terms of what kind of business we hope our government's in and that we're all in. Um, but perhaps um, one of the biggest challenges I think remains thinking about how we understand the right and wrong dynamic that you mentioned. I think as someone from the U.S. Uh, who often travels, it's so easy to get caught in our bubble and assume that actually we do know and that we have the solutions and that we are right. And the, the horrors that we see seem so apparently awful and wrong. But stepping back from that black-white dynamic and thinking what are the root causes behind this and how do we understand them uh, in a reflective role is I think part of the biggest challenge for addressing um, the kind of problems we're facing today. So thank you very much. I look forward to the dialogue. Is that better? Okay. Good. Well, thank you, Bridget, for leading with those questions. And I wonder, Mr. Ambassador, if you'd like to start with the questions. And, or one, or <laughs> you were of them. Thank you for having me. I'll see you all later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, first, let, let me uh, say that I think the questions were, uh, A, very well thought out, and B, you mentioned at the beginning of your comments the arc. Mm -hmm. And I think they are traveling along the same arc we're trying to travel along with. I think we have to be realistic in our, in our ability to make change as quickly as we'd like to. I think there has been significant, uh, significant change coming in these last several years. Um, let me start, if, if I could, uh, back at the beginning on, on the question of counter violent extremism and the importance of uh, getting beyond the you know, individual motivations and things. I don't ask the question why. You know, I, I don't frankly care why a young man or young woman joins an extremist organization. I, I don't know why people do what they do. I've raised two kids. I haven't got a clue. <laughs> um, the question I ask is how? How did this happen? What house of worship did this, in a community of 100 young men, let's say, as an example, where three of them are moved to join ISIL or Al-Shabaab or something else, why those three? What was different about those three? How come those three, what did steps did those three young men take to get there? And if we can look at that and understand the how of what they're doing, perhaps we can design the resiliencies in those communities to prevent the how. So that's the kind of analysis that we are trying to conduct in, in CSO. 
And that really gets to the heart, I think, of making prevention a much more viable and uh, um, visible uh, priority for this government. I mentioned uh, at the outset that evidence matters. Uh, there are many competing uh, priorities uh, for the United States government, for all of you. And understanding what works and what doesn't work is important, and we are still at the very beginning stages of that, quite frankly, in the prevention, uh, in the prevention arena. So I think it's important that we collectively, hopefully, focus on trying to better understand how to evaluate our effectiveness, to understand better how something works uh, to prevent conflict from, from gaining hold. The second thing I would just like to comment on to, to set the sort of the, uh, the frame, if I could, is I agree, we agree in the Bureau, and I think broadly in the State Department, wholeheartedly, that local solutions are better. Um, we're always looking for local solutions. However, I'm also reminded that the thing that is different today uh, than was different for the John F. Kennedy generation is not so much the kind of conflict we face. Remember, John F. Kennedy created USAID, the Peace Corps, and the Special Forces. He understood the complex nature of what we're trying to address. What's different today is speed and mobility. And that takes away locality often. Because what happens in a country doesn't stay in that country. I am reminded in a, that the Zika virus, for instance, comes from a mosquito, I understand, that never leaves more than 100 feet from where it was hatched. But someone who uh, is exposed to that mosquito within nine hours can infect somebody in Milwaukee, 6,000 miles away. That's phenomenal. So understanding local solutions is extraordinarily important, and the Resolve Network is an effort to do that. But we have to link those across these borders because the problems themselves, the perpetrators of these issues, aren't local. They don't stay local. They move. We're watching ISO move across the planet. We're seeing what they're doing. So we have to figure out how to link those things. And that becomes a real challenge, uh, I think, for all of us. So that's uh, at the outset. The last thing I will say on the budgets, I agree. I think it's fascinating, though, to watch the evolution of thinking in the federal government. Yes, we're releasing the USAID state uh, strategy. Importantly, many of you may have seen that the Counterterrorism Bureau at State has been renamed and reconfigured. It is now CT slash CVE, understanding that the hard stuff alone isn't the answer. You have to marry these two things together. That is a formal change in designation uh, for the State Department, and it really does reflect an evolution in the thinking uh, of the State Department. So I think we're on the same arc, hopefully heading in the same direction. So at the risk of your feeling like you have stereo questions, could you say a couple more words about that marrying of the hard strategies and softer strat or peace building strategies? What does that look like in a day-to-day -day basis and how would you then work with that office? Well, I think when I say marrying is probably the wrong word. It, it connotes a, an absolute harmony. Well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> What's the divorce rate in this country? Well, maybe a harmony. But, but it connotes a, a very close working relationship between the two. I think what we understand is we will continue to pursue the hard policies against ISIL and against al-Shabaab and against these people who wish to, to kill innocent people. This, this is the hard reality of life and, and it is the government's responsibility uh, to look squarely at security and understand that. There's no backing away from that. However, we do recognize that that buys us some space. That doesn't solve the problem. I think, uh, and this is at least the the talk that goes around town, you know, we have, we have killed the number three guy in, in Al-Shabaab 15 times. Um, that it's, it's not, it doesn't do it. Uh, you have to have something else. You have to have a better approach, whether it's, it's a local approach or a hybrid approach, but it has to be with civil society organizations, it has to be based on community level action. And that's what we're trying to work on now. Yeah, I just thank you for that. I, I want to jump in because this has been a big issue of discussion among actually the peace building community and the Alliance for Peace Building. And I think personally at least one of my big concerns is that the idea of simply uh, increasing more peace building work while the hard strategies continue, um, while the military approaches and the bombings continue, that actually you're never going to get beyond simple band-aids. So one of the things we know from the Global Terrorism Index is that deaths from terrorism rose 61% right. in 2013. Right. Um, we know from the CIA's own research that you know drone strikes, etc., fuel recruitment. Right. So we know these approaches don't working, don't work, 
yet we continue to kind of give them an okay as long as we put a few more pennies towards peace building. So, you know, I think at some point, I don't, I don't want to marry it at all. I actually really want a fundamental shift to say, we need to recognize what's not working um, seriously and figure out how to shift our investments and our whole strategy to a more preventive peace building approach. So I'm interested to see, certainly, the CVE prevention strategy. I wonder if I could focus for a moment on the prevention side mm -hmm. of, of the aisle, and it's really a question for both of you, since Bridget, you were working on atrocities prevention at AID. This is one of those areas where we still occasionally get tension between the human rights approaches, which tend to undergird the atrocities prevention, and more of the conflict resolution, peace building approaches, where we think about conflict prevention. And do you see those as one spectrum or different sets of modalities? How do you, how do you really marry those, to use mm -hmm. the verb again, mm -hmm. um, but thinking about how both strategies can be used, perhaps just to move the distance back, so we're not dealing with atrocities as they're about to happen? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to go first? <laughs> sure. I mean, I think this is a, a classic tension in our field. Uh, we talk about it as a classic tension, yet at the same time, hum we know human rights are fundamental to peace and to preventing violence, and we know that um, prevention and peace building is fundamental for human rights as well, to secure and maintain human rights. So I think we sometimes keep ourselves in a spiral of thinking these are tensions and things that don't that don't fit together. I know when I was at USAID, um, we, and we put together this field guide on atrocities prevention, we absolutely incorporated human rights strategies, uh, prevention strategies, peace building strategies, and said, you know, it's not about what's the particular activity at the particular time, but what is this context, this situation need? What do the local people in this community need and want most right now? And what's the priority? And then, you know, trying to create a strategy rather than a particular activity. You know, not choosing one or the other, but figuring out how can they fit together over time. Now, I think that makes perfect sense. And I try not to be um, overly ideological in my approach to things. So when we do our assessments, for instance, we send teams out into the field to do an assessment. And we may begin by doing an elections violence assessment uh, asked for by a government or an embassy. And what we discover while we're doing that is what we're really concerned about is preventing an atrocity from happening. So it becomes an atrocity prevention activity. I do think that things do blend often mm -hmm. uh, more closely than being able to, to sort of rigidly, uh, rigidly divide them that way. So when we have several different tools that we use, uh, several different frameworks, but we try to be flexible in terms of our ability, as I said at the outset, to recognize the actual problem we're facing. We, we may think we're facing one problem, and then when we get there, nah, it's, it's something a little bit different. And we need to be able to pivot and understand that problem and address it. And I do think that the, the responses to those problems often are complementary, uh, not mm -hmm. necessarily at odds. Mm -hmm. So before I open up the floor, just one final question, which is how can our community support you during this time, both in the transition process politically that we'll face at the end of the year and in your overall mission? Well, I, I think by helping us, I, I think it, it means by, once again, and being loud and proud, frankly, as, as the transition approaches, making your perspective well known, uh, and making sure that uh, incoming officials understand that this is not a secondary issue, that this is an issue that has to be addressed uh, from the very beginning of a new administration, not arrived at um, after they've tried everything else. Uh, and I think it's important to make sure that the, the progress that has been made so well in this administration through the creation of the APB, the executive order that's gone out, the Resolve Network, uh, the Counterterrorism Partnership Fund, which has taken money now into the State Department, not simply DOD, as a recognition that this has to be a civilian exercise too. I think all that progress has to keep going forward. And uh, I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel simply because we have new occupants in the, in the positions of power. Thank you. Well, I'd like to open the floor and take a couple of questions at a time uh, for both of our panelists. I think, thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you very much, Bridget. I think we've hit at a core of much of the work that needs to be done in the future. In terms of, I, I like many people in this room, 
would spend a lot of time in war colleges, both here and in the UK, where there is a thirst, particularly after the Iraq and mm -hmm. Afghanistan, to learn from the peace-building field, as it were, and recognize that, in fact, where we're trying to go is often fairly similar. Mm -hmm. So it struck me, would it be something useful in starting to think about learning together in a much more formalized fashion? Do we have to have war colleges? Could we not have war and peace colleges mm -hmm. where skills could be shared across the board? I know that would be really problematic, perhaps for some in our field, and particularly perhaps for some in our war colleges. But you know, it is where we're heading. I mean, we all know that war is never going to go back to where it was. We know that there are many parts of war colleges are still hoping that the past wars will come again so that they can use their skills. But really where we are and the issues we're talking about are the ones that the war colleges also need to be talking about. And I met so, some fantastically scintillating, energized people within the colleges who are really, really eager mm -hmm. to expand their repertoire. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Mari. Mari Fitzduff, and if you could also please introduce yourselves as you ask questions. That was number one. Um, just okay, back here, I'm just seeing a blue sleeve with a blue shirt. Hello. Hi. Thank you for your comments. My name is Kieran Singh, and the president of the International Storytelling Center. And I want to welcome the conversation, particularly around conflict prevention. And I say that as an alumni of the Rotary Peace Fellowship Program, which is a very much part of our core of our philosophy. Um, it was interesting to hear some of the comments. That, and the reason there's a lot of complex ideas you talked about. I recently gave a TED talk where they said to you, you have to take a lot of your complex ideas and distill it down into a single idea. And how, what is that single idea, the contribution that you want people to go away with? When you talk about civil society and working in partnerships, what is the single idea that you think that we can take as organizations and institutions to empower people at the local level the individual to contribute towards this greater movement of peace. Thanks, Kieran. One more? Yes, Dean. Thank you very much, Ambassador Robinson. As a former Foreign Service officer and having worked on this issue of peace building, uh, I'm curious as to whether uh, CSO has made any headway on the training issue. Uh, it's well known that in the political cone, most political officers believe that you, you get your political training on the job, but we all know that uh, training in peace building is best uh, done with a combination of on the job and instruction about how to do it. Have you made any headway with FSI on this, on this issue? Thank you. Why don't the two of you take those three, and then we'll see if we have room for another round. Okay. Um, if I may, on the War College uh, question to start with, um, I think it's interesting, at least in my experience, that the single biggest fans that prevention has and CSO has, and that this uh, learning together has, is in fact, uh, especially the higher ranks of the United States military, they do recognize uh, what has to be done. They do recognize that they need a stronger, more capable, more able civilian partner. They need the State Department and USAID and others to be better at what we do and to be more capable of working with them earlier, both in training and in execution. We work as closely with them as we can. But I don't think there's any group that I've met with that doesn't recognize that need more clearly uh, than, than, uh, than, our, than our military does. So I, I think the notion that our war colleges perhaps be renamed, it is a pretty difficult name. I graduated in 2000 and my daughter still doesn't like me for that. <laughs> but it's, it's I, I think that the, the curricula should uh, be looked at. And in my experience is it was moving in that direction to, to understand better how to bring the, uh, the, the peace building, the conflict prevention um, narrative closer to the war fighting. Uh, uh, narrative. So I think that is something that has currency. I think that has, that has some traction. As far as a single idea out of a number of complex ideas, uh, 
I don't, I don't have a single idea other than to say that we have to keep, we, we have to, in a sense, de-glamorize conflict, uh, particularly for, for young men. That has to happen. That has to be seen as unacceptable, very simply. Um, and I think that's an important communal activity, a family activity that can occur. But as long as a young person particularly feels greater empowerment by blowing something up, it's going to be difficult to prevent that from happening. And I think we have to deglamorize this and make sure that empowerment isn't simply about exercising force over other people. I think that's a very dangerous uh, thing, it, and it's common. It isn't in any particular country, it's everywhere. And, and I think we have to change the way we, uh, we, we think of that. And finally, uh, to my colleague from the Foreign Service, we, we have uh, begun uh, to make some progress, not just with FSI, but CSO has got a, a pretty robust training program for atrocity prevention now. We've trained over 400 State Department officers, and then we have brought in uh, diplomats from five other of our uh, friendly countries to have the training as well. We plan to continue to expand that, and at some point it may be moved into FSI, but right now we're still in the developmental stages uh, of that. And we're working with colleagues in, other, in universities uh, to make sure that we're bringing in the best ideas and thoughts we can as we pursue our training as well. Yeah, great questions. Thank you. Um, on the, I would just underline in what uh, the ambassador said about the military being one of the biggest allies. Uh, and I see Lisa Shirk in the back, and she can speak um, better than anyone, perhaps, about those conversations that do happen and are ongoing. Um, I will say that I think one of the challenges with those is that we think it sounds great that everybody can come together um, as equals around a table. But then I often um, talk about it as if you ask DOD, the State Department, and USAID, to all come together and work together. It's a little bit like asking an elephant and two mice to dance together. That's right. So you can imagine what um, the outcomes of that would be. Um, and that's, that's uh, even with best intentions of everyone at the table. On terms of a single idea, um, I don't know that I have an answer either. We, um, you know, one of our taglines is we believe in the power of nonviolence and local action and that is kind of central to us. I think also this idea of going local, I would say let's listen to, not think about how do we empower, but how do we listen to, partner with the company, um, local people. And on training, I would just add that USAID also, we work to develop a training that's um, ongoing and including uh, more and more people all the time with USAID on mass atrocities. And FSI does do something about twice a year where they have a panel, and um, I've been part of that in the past too. So there is progress. Good. Well, I'm afraid we're at the end of our time, so I'd like to thank very much Ambassador thank Robinson, you. Bridget Moix, for a really fascinating discussion today. Thank you.